Every single Android device, every iPhone, every Mac, every Windows 10 and 11 PC, every instance of Firefox, Chrome and Safari, every Airbus A350 and so much more. SQLite is probably the most deployed piece of software ever created, especially since most of these devices will have more than one SQLite database running. SQLite is the actual case for the XKCD about dependencies, except instead of Nebraska it's North Carolina, instead of 2003 it's 2000, and instead of a flimsy piece that could break at any moment, it's a rock solid foundation. Its creator, D. Richard Hip, must be doing something right. In this video, we're going to take a look at the design philosophy of SQLite, try to understand how it got to where it is today, and see what we can learn from that. Any project with the reach of SQLite is worth paying attention to. Let's start from the beginning. Richard Hip never considered himself a database guy. In fact, he still doesn't today, despite writing the most used database ever. But not being a database guy is what gave Richard his original edge. The idea for SQLite came when Richard was working with the US Navy. He was writing an application used by the damage control systems on guided missile destroyers. His application was making read-only SQL queries to a database that kept having connectivity issues. He realized if he could just store the data on disk, but keep the same queries, then he could make his application much more resilient. Which, let's be honest, is a fantastic idea. Without SQLite, your options are either to write directly to a file, or get an entire separate process running to handle database connections. SQLite is a self-contained local storage option that still gives you the power of SQL. And this is where I think Richard's lack of experience as a database designer became a huge strength. The other embedded SQL database engines like MySQL Embedded and so forth, uh, they, they start a separate thread, which is the server. So they don't have a server okay. process, but they do have a server thread. Right. As far as I know. And, well, you know, why didn't I do a, a server thread or something like that? Well, you know, it was easier not to is one reason. Another reason is that, you know, I'm not a database person. I didn't know I was supposed to. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> told me. <laughs> oh, that's, that's rich right there. <laughs> no, no one told me that that's what you were supposed to do. And so I just sat around and thought, well, how can I do this? And, and that, and the way I did it seemed to make sense to me, so that's what I did. An expert may have informed him that without a dedicated process, his database would have concurrency issues, that it would be very difficult to implement transactions, and that it would never scale. But being supposedly misinformed meant that Richard just created a tool for his use case, regardless of common wisdom. A tool which ended up solving problems for many other people too. It's very easy to get lost looking at alternatives to our products, but naivety can be a strength, and a lack of understanding can bring a fresh perspective. SQLite isn't really a database engine. SQLite is a compiler. Richard had lots of experience writing compilers, so he just created a compiler that turns SQL query syntax into bytecode. He leveraged his strength to fix the problem at hand, and did so in a novel but powerful way. SQLite's focus is more so on passing the query language, rather than adding database engine features. So much so that when the first version was written, it used a third-party storage mechanism called GDBM. This is one of the only dependencies the project has ever had, and it was removed for SQLite 2 in favour of a custom engine. Now SQLite has no dependencies. It's distributed as a single self-contained C file. It doesn't rely on any libraries, only basic functions like memcmp instead. Even malloc is optional. It's tiny, weighing in at 0.7 megabytes, and that's what gives it the portability to run on every single operating system, even those that are stripped down for embedded devices. It also means that the developers can wrap their head around the entire codebase. They don't have to be experts in a particular framework or library, just experts in C and fundamental algorithms. Richard believes that freedom is taking care of yourself. That's what people like about backpacking and, and wilderness adventures is they go out and they're, they're responsible for themselves. Every aspect of their lives, they're carrying, they're carrying their house on their back and all of their food. That's what they like. Freedom means taking care of yourself. Obviously, that doesn't appeal to everyone. But it means that Richard isn't bound by anyone else's code, while also giving SQLite the flexibility to grow in features while adhering to strict requirements. The engine is internal to the project, and the parser is one that Richard wrote and open sourced called Lemon. He could have used Yak and Bison, but mastering those tools would have taken more effort than just implementing his own, and a generalized solution always makes compromises that aren't right for your project. 
This paid off when Richard implemented material views for SQLite. With industry standard tools, it would have been difficult to retroactively add a new keyword, since existing databases may already be using that word as a column name, and SQLite versions are always backwards compatible. But using his own parser, Richard could use the context to infer whether the word in the query was a keyword or a column name. He replaced GDBM as the database engine with a custom solution, because he encountered so many edge cases that he would either have had to read the entire source code or write a full test suite to assert its behavior. Richard believes that freedom means taking care of yourself so much that the project even has very few meta dependencies. His text editor is a custom one he wrote himself. He wrote and published his own HTTP server because he realized he either had to read someone else's code to ensure it was secure or spend less time creating his own simple implementation. He wrote his own version control system called Fossil to manage SQLite. It's a single tool that handles source code, wiki, bug tracking, forums, and chat. Richard likes to build things himself. What I found is that when you control your own tools, you can you can go further and do things that that you can't do if you're depending on somebody else for your tools. SQLite is pushing each part of the system to its limit while trying to remain as small and portable as possible. When you take on a dependency, all that code becomes your responsibility. If there is a vulnerability or bug, or if something is incompatible, that's on you. That code is your code now. A lot of the time we take that for granted and blindly trust that a dependency will work like we expect it to. But the truth is that dependency code is still part of your source code, and you should treat it as such. For Richard, it often came down to the fact that his project has so much nuance that he couldn't afford to trust other people's implementations would work well enough. At which point, it was just easier to write something specific for his use case, instead of studying the dependencies and then hoping that they would always support his needs. Richard initially expected SQLite to be just another project that very few people paid attention to but it was released at the perfect time to be a huge part of the smartphone revolution. Richard was meeting with major players like Android and Motorola who wanted to use SQLite on their latest mobile phones. For me, this is the most surprising thing about SQLite. Its strength is in its small size and portability, but Richard responds very positively to feature requests, which can't have been easy given the varying use cases and clients he has. Android phones, car engine control units, and Airbus A350s would all have very different feature requests, but Richard is able to support all of them while keeping SQLite small. One particular example I found fascinating was when someone who was writing software for engine control units wanted to bypass the operating system and write directly to disk. This was a single, relatively small user asking for a feature that is not trivial, but Richard was happy to oblige and added the ability to do so to the source code. The willingness to support anyone is a huge driver for SQLite being so ubiquitous, but this also comes with trade-offs. Richard was able to mitigate these trade-offs by leveraging extensions. The ability to bypass the operating system is in the source code, but not in the standard release of SQLite. Likewise, SQLite comes with many extensions that add functionality for those who need it. The most famous of these is the encryption extension, but there are also extensions for things like compression and JSON support. The core of the library is kept as simple as possible. Richard is very careful whenever it comes to adding any new features. He often says that complexity is your enemy, and I believe it definitely is his. SQLite is bundled as a single C file, and an SQLite database is also saved as a single file. He is optimizing for simplicity, at the cost of everything else, especially when it comes to file format. SQLite has promised to be backwards compatible until 2050. This specific deadline originates from a partnership he had with Airbus in 2010, when they said that the software on their planes should work for the next 40 years. Richard is a man of his word, and that one conversation has become a sort of mantra for SQLite. So a few years ago, when Airbus had contacted us, and they, were, they, they use SQLite in the A350 um, avionics, they asked, uh, we need you to support this for the life of our airframe, which is 40 years. So we said, oh, sure, we'll support it through 2050. <laughs> so we sort of set up the company uh, with the idea that we're going to try and keep it going through the year 2050. He often talks about his willingness to keep the system stable until 2050, but this is no easy feat. The file formats have been completely backwards compatible and mostly forwards compatible since 2004. Richard takes great care whenever any changes are made to the file format more than anything else. Simplicity is also about focus. SQLite's goal is to be the local database at the edge of the network. There are other difficult problems to solve, 
but Richard is focused on solving that one single problem in the simplest way possible. He isn't interested in taking on any more scope. What we have now is enough to keep us busy. And if I try and take on too much, Mm -hmm. we would lose focus and we'd start making mistakes. You have to find the right balance there. And and right now, SQLite is is pushing the limits of what a small team like this can, can reasonably control. To go further, I would no longer be able to understand everything that's in the code. And SQLite cannot afford to make mistakes. In its early years, SQLite had few bug reports, but that all changed when it was adopted into the Android ecosystem. Usage skyrocketed, and that came with many more bug reports. Richard spent the next 10 months, 12 hours a day, 6 days a week, writing a test suite that covered the whole codebase. That's not a solution that's particularly appealing, but it works. Sometimes the only solution is to sit down and put the work in. Having an extensive test suite that you can rely on gives you the confidence to maintain your code in a sustainable way. SQLite has four of these extensive test suites. The first one is a set of unit tests written in the Tickle scripting language. These are the primary tests used during development. They make heavy use of parameterization. There are 51,445 distinct test cases, but thanks to the parameters, there are millions of unique cases. Tickle allows the test to be extremely succinct. SQLite has its own testing framework to make these tests as simple as possible to write. The second test suite is the SQL logic tests. This is an open source test suite that will run the same queries on SQLite and other SQL databases to ensure that the results are consistent. Currently, this is running 7.2 million queries, comparing against Postgres, MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, and Oracle 10G. Based on my research for this video, it seems like Postgres is the king when it comes to SQL. They consistently have the most correct responses, and if Richard isn't sure about something, it's the database engine he usually copies. He managed to segfault every single database engine he tried, including SQLite, except for Postgres. Postgres always ran and gave the correct answer. We were never able to find a fault on that. Now, the Postgres people tell me that we just weren't trying hard enough. It is possible <laughs> to fault Postgres. But we were, we were very impressed. The third test suite is a proprietary fuzz tester. This test suite will inject invalid or unexpected data into both the database file and the SQL query simultaneously. Its intent is to discover completely unexpected error cases and vulnerabilities. Fuzz testing keeps SQLite secure from malicious SQL attacks. A large part of SQLite's test suites are ensuring that it can recover from invalid states, especially on embedded devices that don't have the extensive recovery options of the normal OS. All tests are run on a wide range of operating systems and devices before every major release. This can take hours, so there is also a subset of tests that are used during ongoing development. These run in a few minutes. The final test suite is a proprietary set of tests, written in C, that provide 100% branch test coverage of the core SQLite library at the machine code level. This test suite is SQLite's intellectual property. You can fork the repository, but you won't get the security that this test harness brings. This test suite has another 50,362 cases that are also parameterized resulting in another 2.4 million cases. This test suite tests every possible branch and condition in the source code. I don't usually believe that test coverage is a particularly useful metric. 100% branch coverage is a lot of effort with strong diminishing returns. But Richard has mentioned several advantages to this approach. The first one being that the weird tests you have to write in order to cause a branch to go one way or another often uncover issues in unrelated parts of the system. You have to write such specific tests that you end up finding issues you had never thought of in the first place. Another advantage is that you have the confidence to change any single line of code, knowing that you will have full observability on the impact of that change. The last advantage is that these tests are testing machine code rather than source code. Any compiler bugs are inherently bypassed, and undefined behavior, which is usually a dragon in C, is mitigated. At the end of the day, 100% coverage is just a threshold, and you should pick whatever threshold suits your needs. For SQLite, 100% makes sense because of how critical its uses can be. It cannot afford to fail. And despite this, SQLite still has very active development, with a high rate of code changes. They just spend even more time adding new tests for those features. It has slowed from from the early days, but I mean, we still are adding a lot of features and we do a lot of changes. We don't talk about the rate of code churn very much because that would scare people. Because it's high? 
it is for a piece of software that this is, that's used this widely and and is used so much. But we do have we actually spend most of our time testing it, you know, because uh. we'll, we'll do a new feature and, and and adding the feature takes an hour, and then we'll spend weeks just testing it. They can continue to improve the library without affecting any existing clients because of the confidence that these test suites provide. Even with a very small team, Richard currently only has two people helping him with SQLite. Dan Kennedy has been a major contributor since 2002, and 99% of the code will come from either Richard or Dan. And Joe Mistashki also helps as a subject matter expert. SQLite keeps such a small team, partly because it works for them, but partly because it's very difficult for them to accept public contributions. SQLite's licensing is so permissive that it's actually part of the public domain. This makes it harder for others to contribute, since they have to complete the legal paperwork to add the contributions to the public domain. This decision also came with some sneaky advantages. Since the public domain is not recognized everywhere, some companies prefer to pay for a dedicated license anyway. This used to be how SQLite made most of its money. Richard put it into the public domain and people wanted to pay for it anyway. Now there is also a consortium, which was started when a large client was worried that the project wouldn't survive if Richard was hit by a bus. All the monetization for SQLite essentially came from Richard releasing everything for free and companies wanting to pay him anyway. This project is the perfect example of if you build it, they will come. That being said, Richard could still be making a lot more money if he was more aggressive with his monetization. But he is happy, working on a project that he enjoys working on. Squeezing every dollar out of SQLite is not his goal. People tell me I could have made yeah. a lot of money on this if I'd had any business sense. And I believe them. I probably could have. If I hired <laughs> some salespeople, I could probably make a lot of money and get rich. But you know what? We make enough. It's yeah. not a lot. I, you know, I'm, I'm driving a 10-year-old Civic, you know, but that's fine. That's all I need. Richard has another major project that hasn't seen nearly as much success as SQLite. He's a strong believer that although Git is the perfect source control for the Linux kernel, it isn't well suited for smaller projects and teams. Fossil is a simpler alternative to Git that never ever deletes history and uses SQLite to store its data. Richard is a big believer in dogfooding his projects, and Fossil gives him the chance to experience SQLite as a user. Some people have been offended by his unashamed distaste for Git and other strong opinions. But I think there is a reason that people as successful as Richard are often so opinionated. You have to back yourself up and be willing to trust your judgment, letting go of the fear of other people's opinions. It would be better that 5 people hate you and 5 people love you than for 10 people to be equally indifferent about you. Don't let your projects drown in mediocrity. Do something big and do it your way. But also try to remain humble when you should. Richard trusts his own judgment, but he isn't condescending or negative. He always seems happy and eager to learn, and doesn't give himself credit when he definitely deserves it. At the end of the day, Richard is just a tinkerer. He is using the tools he has to create new things. That's what brings him joy, and that's all that matters. Not all of his projects are incredibly popular. He is just making things that interest him. It just so happens that one of those projects ended up being the most deployed piece of software ever created. SQLite is a perfect example of what can happen with open source software and a dedicated maintainer. Richard just tries to keep everything as simple as possible and stumbled into a database empire. He started by fixing his own problem using the skills he had. He isn't chasing glory or money, but is just content bringing value to the people who rely on him. He works hard to keep all users happy and relies heavily on tests to ensure the stability of a program. He believes that freedom is taking care of yourself and doesn't rely on any internal or external dependencies, which has allowed SQLite to be as portable and successful as it is today.